Welcome to Module 2 Analysis, where I'm going to dive deeper into the shortlist phase. I'm going to talk about the filters in more detail and answer some of the common questions I typically get about the filters. I taught you in this module that the shortlist phase is about the logic of selling the products you found in the search phase. I taught you about the six filters. The first filter I showed you is about who is selling the product. Then we have the number of reviews. Then we looked at the listing quality, which involves a little bit of art, and I gave you a four-part formula to measure the listing quality. Then we have the optimum sales price. We looked at whether something was isolated. And finally, we looked at the brand equity, or was this a big brand or not? The first field was looking at who is selling this product and who's fulfilling it. There are basically three options to choose from in our spreadsheet. Is the product being sold by Amazon and fulfilled by Amazon? Is it being sold by FBA from a seller like us? Or is it being sold FBM by a third party merchant selling it, but not using Amazon's fulfillment service because they are fulfilling it on their own? I showed you where you could find the answer to who is selling the product inside the listing. It either says shipped and sold by Amazon, or it says something like sold by such and such a company and fulfilled by Amazon. Or the third option is it might say shipped and sold by a particular merchant, a particular company. This is the FBM option. I sometimes get asked the questions, if Amazon is selling this item, should I sell it? And the answer is that no one element rules a product in or rules a product out in the shortlist phase. This is a different um, module to the previous search phase, where in that phase, we talked about the viability of the product. In the search phase module, we had things like hazardous products, and that was one element, and that would rule a product out. The shortlist phase is very different. In the shortlist phase, we're scoring products to come up with the, the most logical products to sell. We're applying logic to product research and we're looking at the most popular elements of a certain listing and we're saying what hurts us and what helps us. If we look at the things that help us in terms of who is selling the product, the thing that helps us the most is if there is a merchant who is selling that product and they're fulfilling it themselves because we know that we can do better than that by doing FBA. Our consumers will see that our product is being fulfilled by Amazon, so they'll associate us with Amazon, and some will even assume that we are Amazon. We need to be aware though, that if the seller is using FBM because the product, it could be hazardous. So we might just need to um, have a look again. It might be something that only Amazon can fulfill. Um, it might be worthwhile having a look at the item specifics to avoid and just check in case we miss something in the previous module. The second filter is the number of reviews. Some people become obsessed with reviews, they become obsessed with getting them and they become obsessed with looking at them. Really all we're looking at to do here is assess how long a product has been available, how much history is behind that listing on Amazon. One of the key things that's going to help you do very well on Amazon is when your listing has some history. In other words, it's been available for a long time on Amazon. The product has had an opportunity to sell for quite some time. So the reason that we're looking at reviews is to get a feel for the longevity of the item. The number of reviews doesn't tell us how this product is selling right now, but it, it does have a slight connection to how that product has sold, how long it has sold for, and that sort of thing. Because it's going to be slightly more difficult for us to compete with a listing that has you know five, six, or 10 years worth of history, as opposed to competing against a listing that's maybe only six months or a year old. The BSR is what tells us how it's selling, not the reviews. So it doesn't matter how many reviews it has, but the reviews are important for us to gauge how we're going to be able to compete with it. The number of reviews is part of this big jigsaw that we're putting together. If a product has over 500 reviews, it doesn't say to us that we cannot compete with it, nor does a product that has less than five tell us that we're going to be able to compete with it either. It's one part of the six filters that I'm, I'm teaching you in the shortlist phase. What I want to do is simply score how many reviews the item has in the spreadsheet. The whole module is all about scoring the six filters as accurately as possible. Now the next filter is the listing quality. This is where we get a little bit more artistic. It can be a tricky filter to measure because it's more subjective than the other filters. I don't want to give you something that is pure art that you're going to have to go and figure out for yourself. So I did bring in some science into this. I talked about the four elements that are involved in a product listing. The four core elements that we're looking at are the images, title, bullets, and descriptions. These are the core elements that make a customer choose to buy a product or not. 
because the consumer cannot touch a product the way they can in a real retail store. It's up to us to get the consumer as close to touching the product as humanly possible. And we only have a few elements to do this. Image is one element. So we need to have high resolution images in our product listing. When a competitor is not using high resolution images, that's a good thing for us to see because we know we can do better with our product listing. We look at how many images are present and are there even multiple images? If there are not multiple images, then we don't score a point for this element. If there are multiple images and you can't zoom into them, we don't score a point for this element either. There's another way of looking at it as well. If you know that if you had that product and you could beat those images, then it does not deserve to score a point in that particular element. We're talking each one of the listing elements and we're applying a score between zero and one. I taught you in this module that if an element isn't there or, or is very poor, you just wouldn't score a point. If it was kind of there, you could give it a half mark if you have to. You could even give something like a three quarter mark or a one quarter mark if you need to. This gives us a score and allows us to get a feel for how well we can improve our product. In the next modules, we're gonna look at our competitors' listings and say, yeah, I can do better than this or I can score better than this product listing. When we look at product titles, we're looking at a lot of variables, so it's not easy to give you an exact way to score this element. When we're looking at a title, it's, it, if we take the example of plastic shoebox, then you don't wanna score this a point if it just said plastic shoebox. The reason we score zero is because you can compete with this title and you can make your title better by adding extra keywords and more data. We want people to be able to find our product when they type in the keywords into the search box on Amazon. If we see a lack of detail in the product title, then we don't give it a point. When we are scoring listing quality by judging titles, images, bullets, and description, nothing rules a product in and nothing rules a product out. If you give it a score as accurately as you can in the spreadsheet, that's all that matters. The shortlist phase is just one of the research phases. We've got more phases of research to do, which is gonna further help us select our first product. So we need to score the bullets. We score zero points if we see bullets that are poorly written, not much detail, no indication as to the size of the product, what capacity it can hold, anything that would allow us to get a sense of what the product actually is and whether or not we would wanna buy it. If the bullets are well written, they've got keywords in them, they aren't stuffed, but they're well written bullet points that describe the product accurately, describe the dimensions, how much the product might hold, that kind of thing, then the listing will score a point. If the bullets include things like delivery information, company information, these are all examples of poorly written bullets. And bullets that are kind, they kind of go against Amazon's terms of service. So we would score them poorly. In this case, and, and we might even give them a zero or a half a point. So bullets are there to further enhance the detail of what the product is. Bullets contain things that, that should not be in the title and maybe not in the description. The bullets are there to tell the consumer about the product and provide further information. For bullets to score one point, they've got to be descriptive, they've got to be good quality bullets that contain the right information. Now moving on to descriptions, I don't want to put much value on the description. The reason is because the images, title and the bullets are the most important elements of the product listing. They're the three core drivers that will convert a browser into a buyer on Amazon. If there's a description present, we're just going to give it one point. If there's nothing there, we're going to score it a zero. If there's just a whole bunch of jumbled up words and sizes and random information, we're going to score it a zero because it's not really a description. If on the other hand it's well laid out and decently written, we'll give it one point. In terms of description, most buyers on Amazon don't scroll down that far on the listing. Most people just look at the images, they look at the title, and then they go to the bullet points, they find out the information that they want about the product, and then they just purchase it. So we total up the scores from each of the four product listing elements, and we enter the overall score into the spreadsheet for this particular filter. Now we look at optimum sales price, and it's a much easier filter to score. Is the product in the seven to $30 price range? If it is, select this in the spreadsheet. If it's over $30, then select this in the dropdown of the spreadsheet. The impulse purchase is really what we're looking for in this seven to $30 price range. Next is the filter of isolated products. An isolated product is one that doesn't contain a bonus product of any kind. The product is sold on its own. If you sold a 10 pack of plastic shoe boxes, that would actually be isolated because it's just a pack of 10. 
there's no additional item that's complementary. If it has a bonus product, then we would mark as non-isolated in the spreadsheet. The vast majority of products that you're going to see out there on Amazon are going to be isolated. The most common bonuses that you're going to see are going to be a PDF cookery book or some sort of recipes or something. But people usually take shortcuts there and you know, because it's very easy to add a PDF or an ebook to your Amazon listing, but that's not really adding value. A PDF file is the easiest and lowest common den denominator. Instead of a PDF in a, in a later module, we'll look at how you can choose good bonuses, something which is complementary to the function of the product. So if we find an isolated product, that's a good thing for us because we can make a better listing and make a better offer when we list our competing product. That's why this is one of the filters in the shortlist phase. Now brand equity is a filter also, and I brought it in to deal with big brands like, like a Black & Decker or companies like Apple as well. A big brand will sway the sale and the customer is buying because they want the brand as opposed to something else. A big brand doesn't rule the product in or rule it out, it's just part of the scoring process. So if you look at some big brands, Apple might sell a product for say $100, whereas you could sell a generic version of that same product for $20 or $30. Therefore, are you likely to compete against them? Yes, you are, and you can, because you can go for a, a different market. We don't want to be in a situation where we need to use Apple in our title for our product as well, because it's an item specific to avoid in terms of IP infringement that I taught you in the last module. If we came across a big brand that had a lot of listings, over 100 items, and we looked at their website, and they seem to have international distribution, or if they seem to sell in hypermarkets and supermarkets, we simply just mark it as a big brand in the spreadsheet. We don't sit there and wonder for hours, should we do it, should we not do it? We just mark it as a big brand and move along knowing that the system, the 4S system, the spreadsheet is going to actually score this for us. It's going to help us then figure out what's our best opportunity. We don't have to do all the mathematics here ourselves. We are simply recording what we see and putting it in the spreadsheet. Some of the criteria we do have to think about, like the four listing quality elements, we do have to score that we do have to work that out and then put it into the spreadsheet as a score. So what are the best filters that we could find? What product filters are going to be the best and highest scoring? Well, the first filter that is the best scoring for our product is fulfilled by a merchant themselves or FBM. We also want to see a product that has low reviews. We want to see a product that has a poor quality listing. We want to see something inside the optimum sales price of $7 to $30. We want to see a product that is isolated. And finally, we want to see a product that is not a big brand. That's what's going to get us the highest score of 14 points. That's what would logically be our best product to sell on Amazon FBA. We would rather compete against a listing like that with 14 points than go up against a listing that's sold by Amazon, has more than 500 reviews, is a perfect quality listing, is outside the optimum sales price, is not isolated because it has a bonus, and it is a big brand. You can start to see the, the picture now as to why we want to have these six filters. But no one filter here rules a product in or out. If Amazon's selling it, that doesn't mean we can't sell it. If it's a big brand, it doesn't mean we can't sell it. These are important filters that I want to implant into your brain. Completing the shortlist phase is actually pretty simple. All we're doing here is we're scoring as I've outlined in the videos in the shortlist module. This has been a discussion video and I just wanted to uh, get you to understand why I've done it the way I've done it. And the point of this discussion is to get you to simply score the products from the search phase in the spreadsheet and don't overthink it too much. The league table that's produced at the end of the shortlist phase tells us what is logical to see on Amazon. The highest scoring products in the shortlist phase are the most viable and the most logical products that you have found so far based on the scores you've given these products. The highest score on the spreadsheet, like I said, is a 14, and the lowest score is obviously a zero. People ask me, so what do I do with these different products? Every time you score a product, the product will move into the next phase for you, irrelevant whether it's a zero or a 14 or somewhere in between. It'll just move on to the next stage. It's up to you what you do with it. What I wanna do as I talk about in the building block, is anything that is a 10 and over. These are now the most logical products to move forward. But anything under a 10, we're gonna keep it there because it's still research. We still have some data about that product. It's important to keep that research for a later date, 
But for now, we're gonna have a batch of products we can move on into the next phase and deal with right now. Just because something scores a 14 doesn't mean it's gonna actually make it to the end of the research phase. You might have a product that's a 10 and you're thinking, okay, we'll see what happens. All of a sudden, you find it's incredibly profitable in the next stage and it has lower competition overall in that market. Now all of a sudden that becomes the winner near the end of the process. So we don't know right now. All we can do is score the best we can, get a league table in place, and then we know what moves to the next phase, which is of course the select phase. That's gonna be broken into two parts as I'm sure you might have seen within the program. So there's a lot to cover in the next phase. Now you've done an awful lot to date and now I wanna just move you to the next phase and we can learn more about the research process. Remember, we're doing this to find products we can sell for the next three, five, or even 10 years. It really is worth doing this process. Don't skip this with software outside of the spreadsheet I provided you. Don't try anything different outside the system I'm teaching you. Follow what I'm telling you to do and you will find the best opportunities. If there was a quicker way, I would share the quicker way with you. Follow, implement, get the building blocks in place and get yourself into the select phase when you have enough products that have come through your spreadsheet. Some products are gonna fade away. It's just how it is. You now have something that's been scored. Although we're gonna keep them, some are scoring low and less products are gonna move through the system. It's important for a number of things. Not only should you keep going back and putting more products into your search phase list to keep the pipeline going, but also now you can see what you shouldn't have been selling. It's good to know what products that you will sell, but it's also just as important to know what you shouldn't sell. You don't wanna do that, and this shortlist phase is helping you to avoid those kinds of things. So get implementing, and I'll see you in the next module, where I'm gonna talk about the first phase of the select phase.